So yeah, thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation and thank you for yeah being here to to talk about landscape underground landscape. Uh, I took the I took the the topic literally, not metaphorically, and because in fact I I am a landscape architect, but my my background is in agronomy, so I'm an, an, an agronomist. I'm from Spain, and in fact, I built my all my research and all, all my practice based on, on on this idea of the of the landscape that Augustin Berg would define as a, the product of labor. So, in fact, I, I I spent maybe 20 years of my first professional life building projects in a Mediterranean context in Spain. I was really local. I was uh, really trying to do things with nothing. This idea of, of understanding very well what are the limiting factors, what are the limitations, and how to how to make soil, how to make possible life on those very strict landscapes. And I think that this is what we have inherited, and this is what has shaped me and has shaped me in my practice. So always trying to do projects that are very smart, very efficient, thinking about water as a as a resource that we have to care about and in a way when you are doing when you are having a practice uh, somehow you don't have time to think and, and to have a position what was nice or terrible for me is that in 2008 it was this big crisis in Spain and I had to leave the country so I, I went to the States I went to Virginia and I became the uh, the chair of the landscape architecture program there, and I had to reframe myself. I didn't know who I was when I was there. And somehow I, I like that Jen is here because we come from very, very different backgrounds and we are talking about landscape, but landscape for Jen, or m maybe no, it's, it's, it's coming together, but has nothing to do. So what I carry in my shoulders has nothing to do with what Jen is carrying in her shoulders. No. Um, so then... Um, I started working more in academia. It, this is what I'm going to share with you. With you today, I'm going to share a project that I did just before leaving to the States and how this project uh, changed the way of, of thinking about landscape and how I started looking at landscape uh, architecture in a different way and doing research in that direction. Okay, I define landscape architecture as, or landscape architects as translators. I, I think that... Uh, I like to think that we are translators of potentials. So somehow uh, we are the ones that we can look at, at a place and we can go to a place and see what, as humans, we are able to produce from that place. No? So what is the potential of this place? And then uh, I, I, like, I, li I like thinking that we are, not, uh, we are working always in, in social and historical context and we have always to to have this conversation with our clients, with our, uh, for the people that we work with. And I, I applied or I started thinking that with this idea of potential, I can say, okay, if you have four drops of water, you can have that. If you have 10, uh, ten drops of water, you can have this other thing. If you manage that way, you can have that. And then have this conversation. Because I think that finally uh, we, are, we are just... Uh, as a designers, and uh, in that sense, I think that we are very different than architects. We are just starting a, a new conversation to a place that is not going to be in our hands. And this idea that we don't manage, we don't produce the landscape, we just start a new a new thing um, that it's going to happen. It's what I wanted to share with you today. And ho how to? It's like an impossible task. No, is how can we be translators? What are we translating? And what is the language of this translation? In my opinion. If you, if you cannot be there and be the gardener, the language of translation, it's drawing. So I'm going to talk about drawing and how we can bring knowledge into the drawing of landscape architecture. Okay, so I'm going to start uh, talking about the, the landfill. I don't know how I have to go to the next slide here. I don't know if you see the slides well, but I can describe. This is, a, this is the landfill of the city of Barcelona. This is a 70 hectare. Uh, uh, site that had not uh, vegetation, it was uncovered, and it was the place where the, all the trash of the city of Barcelona was placed. Um, uh, it started in 1974 and it was closed in 2004. Okay, so during more than 30 years, 
this valley that it was a valley in in a in a in a range of mountains that is just uh, maybe 20 kilometers south of Barcelona, they were filling this valley with trash, with a sandwich of trash and earth, trash and earth. And I was lucky enough to, to be there when uh, this restoration uh, started. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to explain this project through a very critical point of view, what I learned uh, about this project. Uh, the first thing that uh, we missed, and I'm going to start with this section that I, I, I was drawing after the restoration, is that we forgot the geology. Uh, this landfill was filled in a karstic condition, so all of these uh, range of mountains are karstic. It's called Garrab, and now it's a natural park. And when they started building the, the valley, they the theoretically, they isolated with clay uh, the 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 bottom of the valley from the karstic condition. But we all know that this was very difficult and nobody was looking at that. This was happening during the dictatorship. And this had very, very bad consequences for all the, all the caves. All the caves were contaminated. So this is the first thing that we didn't know and we were not taking in account. Of course, when we arrived there, uh, it was too late. The valley was already filled with trash, but all of this trash was alive. So all of this, uh, as Jane was talking, no, this material that comes from the city, that it's a material that it's alive because it has a lot of organic material, was decomposing and was leaching into the caves. Okay? And this contamination uh, is lasting and it's still there. And it was not only this liquid, but also the gases. But still, we were just saying that we were restoring this, uh, uh, this landscape. The second thing that uh, I want to talk about, it, it's about the project. So the idea was about to build like a system, a system of terraces that would, um, would uh, stabilize this, this, uh, the slope because this was 70 hectares filling a valley that had a very steep slope. And the first reaction of, of us, I was working with architects too, was to, to, to create like this system of terraces. And again, I want to talk uh, here about uh, maybe the lesson that we'll learn later, and I'm going to talk maybe later about that. But uh, the idea of, 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 of transporting the image of the Mediterranean terraces into, into a project that it's a landfill. And th this was a very difficult. And uh, it was very difficult because the shape of this landscape was not a continuous slope. When the, the, the peasants uh, or the farmers build terraces, usually there is like a, a, a morphology. Well, I'm going to say that, and I've seen very, very weird terraces today here. But somehow <laughs> in, in, in Spain, so th there is like there is a direct relationship between the slopes and, and the size and the dimension of the terraces, okay? In, in this case, we were like imposing this language of terraces, and I don't, I don't know if you see well the terraces, but uh, there is a section here of, the, of this organic shape, and on top of that, we were creating this system of terraces. Uh, this system of terraces were uh, 10 meters, so it, it was not in terraces in stone, but it was like a dam, and that was 10 meters uh, tall, that, uh, it's, it's, it's a dimension that we don't have, but anyway, it, it, somehow this was the dimension that we thought that was the correct one. Uh, but it, somehow we were imposing this new language on top of this organic language. And you will see why I'm saying that later. When we're doing this, this, this superposition of, of topography on top of the existing condition, we had to add a lot, a lot, a lot of soil. Okay, and, and I remember that it was this group of ecologists that were saying this makes no sense. In certain areas, we had to add nine meters of soil. And the, the, the point that uh, while we were adding this nine meters of soil in certain areas and building this system of terraces, uh, we would never arrive to the elevation, to, to, to the to the spot elevation that we were thinking. And this is why, because we were just compacting the soil and the landfill was settling because all of this trash has a lot of space in between. So this was this, this moment of, of despair that we keep adding soil and the, uh, the landfill was really settling until a certain point that uh, we achieved like the system of terraces and you can see here, or maybe you don't see it here, but 
you see um, uh, on top of this, once we had the topography of the terraces, we, we add like these layers of gravel, uh, this imperver impervious uh, layer of plastic in order to isolate the landfill from the upper part. And then we, we built a system of wells that would extract the gas. And so all of this system of wells were uh, placed and designed according to the system of terraces. And we were extracting the gas and the gas was used for electricity. But again, on top of all of the earth, we were extracting the gas and the landfill would settle and settle and settle. Okay. Uh, after that, and again, talking about uh, how to build soil, of course, all of this earth that we were using for, for, for building the, the landfill, where was coming from? No? So then this would be a, a very good question. In that, at that moment, they were building the metro in Barcelona. So part of this soil was coming from the underground uh, Barcelona. But of course, this was not soil. This was just earth or just uh, uh, mineral or rocks. Well, not, not rocks exactly. Eh? But then we had to... Uh, come up with a strategy to build soil, to, come, to transform this earth, this, this um, infertile soil, into a soil. And in order to do that, we, um, we started using uh, practices that uh, farmers use, is that to use uh, legumes that somehow fix the nitrogen from the atmosphere. And we would uh, do like this rotation, this system of, of plots that would reincorporate uh, all of this uh, vegetation into the soil, and over time, we were building uh, this new soil, like this new placenta, uh, that would support life on top of the of the landfill. But of course, this was only on the on the last uh, meter. And after that, we come out with the plantations. It was a very uh, very simple system. Is that we spent a lot of money to plant in front of the dams of, of the terraces and less money to the, to the terrace themselves. It was just seeds, seeds and shrubs, okay? And we were using, um, okay, I don't have the picture here, but we were, we were uh, using cows to manage all of the uh, grasses that were appearing uh, in between the, in between the, uh, the shrubs. Uh, you have to think that this is like a slope that is facing south, it's very dry and, and with the, with the help of the cows and with the strategy of planting very small and in the right moment that it's in, in fall, so we, we come up with this uh, final image. And I am always saying that uh, this is just an image of a project that it's not perfect. And it's not the project that, in my opinion, uh, it's not the project that really um, brings this logic of the Mediterranean, logic of, of using the minimum to uh, to build a new landscape. This is like a transportation of an image, a transportation of a system of terrors into a place that has this movement. And I was obsessed with that. I was really obsessed about how this was not the best project, but had this very beautiful picture. Sorry, I, I don't know how to go. It had this very beautiful picture that won a lot of, in, a lot of awards, and I was really upset. I was upset because the way that we celebrate architects and landscape architects in general, we celebrate images, we don't celebrate projects. Celebrate meaning we, when we publish projects or when we send that to awards, they, we just look at the surface. We really don't look at, the, at, the, at what's going on, what is the metabolism of this place, what is going on underneath, how all of this trash is contaminating the beaches that are uh, two kilometers away, and how this is not the best solution for this place. Okay. And, and the main thing, and I don't know if you see the drawings, but um, when we were building these terraces, we were creating two, two channels on the edge, on the, on the edge condition of the landfill, and the moment that the landfill meets the mountain in order to, to split the water that was contaminated, that was coming from the, uh, the landfill from the water from the mountain. And with this settlement, and I, Below, there is like a drawing that shows that the landfill was just settling. Uh, somehow, all of the water system was not working. All of our idea of terraces that would uh, uh, evacuate the water was really not working. 
so then with this, um, at that precise moment, I, I went to Virginia and I, I asked my student from, uh, from the, uh, the Department of Landscape Architecture to find what was the best solution for this landfill. And the best solution for this landfill, and this is one of the projects of one of my students, was something totally different, was um, something that had to do with understanding very well the, uh, the geology of the place, understanding very well the climate, understanding very well how the water could move here, and, and taking the data of where the landfill was settling and, and reacting to that. So we are doing a project in a place that keeps like uh, resettling. And those are the drawings of, of, this, uh, of this student that she was like uh, creating like watersheds and trying to, uh, to think, sorry, this is the area where we were uh, doing the, redoing the project that it was phase two. Um, and, 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 and this is the project that to me was really responding better to the, to the, to the condition of the landfill. And this, this, this image or this, this system, what she was doing was to creating, uh, create a system of berms, like a system of, of very big like um, dams somehow that would cut uh, the, the path of the water and that would adapt to the topography and that could somehow move and if, if, if some of these berms would settle, uh, nothing would happen to, to, to the landscape. Uh, but of course, this is an image that we have never seen before. This is an image that has nothing to do with the terrace of the Mediterranean, has nothing to do with anything that we have seen before, but has all the intelligence. Somehow, what really interests me and, and in order to, to, to design new landscapes, I think that we have to really look at what is the limiting factor, what is the intelligence that are behind those landscapes. And sometimes if we just learn the intelligence or the practice in this case of, 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 of doing a stones, uh, a stone, dry stone walls or, or paving and somehow we, we have a lot of room, a lot of things that we could be inventing. So what interests me about this project, it's about, it's the intelligence that it's behind. It's like using very few money uh, in order to get the maximum. And in the introduction, I think that in a certain moment, you have talked about having money from the European Union. What happens with the landscape and uh, the difference between this project and the previous project is that the previous project had a lot of money from the European Union. Somehow we, w we had no restrictions. And I have totally the feeling that when you don't have restriction, you are really lost. So the projects are much worse. So when you have restrictions, and this is a project that has all the restrictions, is that you use the minimum amount of earth, you use the minimum amount of everything, and, and then you come out, you have to go to the, to the roots, to the really understand what's, what's the best answer for this place. And I'm saying that because I really belong this, to this landscape of, of survival, this, this idea of the limiting factors, this idea of caring about the amount of water, taking the shore that it's very short because I am in Greece. And, uh, and I think that this kind of um, uh, attitudes of, of metabolism uh, uh, are, are something that, that somehow we have to, uh, yeah, to take in account. And, uh, and this is who I am and it's the way that I'm teaching and the way that I'm, I'm teaching landscape architecture. Because at the end of the day, you want, this project that is unique to this place and it's really the answer, no? the, the, uh, it's a potential, is what I, I was uh, saying before. It's like, what's the potential of this place? Wh how can I do something with nothing? I don't know if you are seeing well all of these diagrams, but at a certain point I was saying, even after doing this system of berms, there is no need to plant. Let's, let's just the place to recover by, by itself. But one thing that, uh, yeah, we had to do is to, to recover the fertility of the soil. So how can you just as a landscape architect create like this new infrastructure, this new condition for the place to keep the, uh, follow the conversation. And I became obsessed about how, how to do a project just recovering the quality of the soil without plants. And of course, this is not possible. And maybe I'm gonna go to, uh, to the next chapter I don't know if I am on time, but I'm going to just explain what it's my research now in, in Zurich and how everything comes from that point. In a certain moment, it's like everything is about soil. Everything is about the fertility of the soil. 
Everything is about keeping the drops of water in, at the right place. Everything is about recovering the, um, the life of this placenta that somehow feeds the planet. And uh, yeah, because Timingol is here. So I, I just, I went through the States and then I went to, to, to Harvard, to the GSD, and then I got this uh, uh, professorship in, uh, in Zurich and I called my chair, Chair of Being Alive, because the book of, uh, of Tim. Uh, and I'm going to share what I am doing, and I wanted just to to travel uh, to my web page, but I think that you can look at the web page later. And I'm going to show how, what, in what way uh, I've been developing this research. And the first thing is that, as a translators, I, I'm trying to build bridges between science and and landscape. And, and the only way, and to, to build bridges, meaning um, being a translator of all of this knowledge, not on, but not only the knowledge of science, but also the knowledge of all kinds of knowledge, and also historical knowledge. So everything that has a, a meaning at all different levels, it's welcome in our chair. And um, we translate everything into drawings, okay? so. In, in my chair, we, th this is the, the web page, and the web page has four entries. One entry is sources, second entry is translation, three, uh, third entry is proposal, and fourth entry is celebration. And the idea of, of having these four entries is that we share with everybody what are our sources of knowledge. Somehow I think that it's important to be able to track down uh, where the decisions come from as a designers. And, uh, we, I've been, we have been collecting. Uh, we have been collecting from different fields, from different fields of science, um, knowledge that can be translated into drawings in a systematic way. So here you you will see like this page of of, of sources. Where are the sources about soils, about the life of, of trees, about biodiversity, about root systems, about uh, forms of classification of the um, of the life cycle of plants, plant communities, and so on and so on, and and then um, for each project, and this is something that I've started doing in my in my office also is like instead of rushing and going to a proposal very fast, we give time, we put we we give a space and time to add other intelligences, uh, the intelligence of the living systems, the intelligence of the cycles of time, the intelligence of, of the, of the geology condi geological condition, of the climate. So we always draw climate geology as, as a super systematic for each project. Uh, for example, for climate, we use the Gaussian diagram that it's very useful for landscape architects that shows pluviometry versus um, uh, temperature and then you can see visualize very quickly the periods of drought of, of places and then when you draw everything with the same language then the project appears and this is a theory that they have and I promise you that this happens but you, you first have to find what is the a common language that can uh, bring everything together okay so we have sources uh, I'm gonna explain uh, a translation this act of translation, we are doing that, uh, uh, this act of, of translation for, for soils, uh, specifically. Uh, so we have this one week, um, one week uh, classes, courses with soil scientists, and we are working with them trying to find, to find a drawing that defines the texture and the qualities of the soil. And we are using very simple uh, language. I don't know if you see here, and I don't know if you are familiar with the triangle of textures that uh, define the proportion between clay, silt, and, and sand. And then we create like a, um, a hatch that combines these three uh, particles. And then in between the three particles, uh, there is the quantity of water. And somehow we are, what I'm gonna show you is the, the this is the way that it appears in the in the web. Then we are creating like um, uh, uh, a definition with grasshopper, and this definition, when you put the data, you have the soil, 
And we hope that we're going to share that with other programs in landscape architecture or even with architects in order for them to visualize. Like in this, is, this is a diagram, it's a dynamic diagram that shows the, the, what really matters for us uh, in terms of soil. Okay, so you see here like these beautiful images of, that describe soils. Um, this is the, the triangle of textures. For agronomists, this is a very normal way of looking at or trying to approach two soils, uh, looking at what, are, what is the proportion of these three particles, because uh, the proportion of these three particles define really the, the quality the, and the behavior of the soil. Then uh, oh, this is the transformation or the translation of this triangle of textures with this other hatch of, of triangles that has the three particles. So it's like a fractal uh, system. And for you, maybe now it's new, but after two years of using this language, we get our eye uh, in our department, in our chair, uh, used to read those languages. And, and it's very beautiful to start seeing the, to compare one soil with another soil through this uh, language. Um, well, and th this is like, maybe you don't see that very well, but this is like how we are using the definition, the grasshopper definition. And then how in between all of these three particles, there is air and this, there is air and, and water. And those are, this is a graphic of the scientists that we use to explain um, the amount of water that is available in the soils and how, because the soil uh, holds water, but not all of this water can be taken by plants. So only the, the water that goes from, set, uh, from um, wilting pine and fill capacity, this is the amount of water that the plant can get. And we can draw that, uh, that water and visualize this uh, in a drawing. And then finally, we in this space, we add organic material that it's really very important. It's air, water, um, uh, texture, and organic material. And, and again, this is a program that I hope that we're going to be able to share soon that helps to visualize the, the quantity of or organic material in, in a soil with all of these new textures. So somehow, we are transforming this, this image here that you can see here with a language that uh, we can share with others and that a language that can start influencing uh, the way that we do landscape architecture. Um, and this is, for example, uh, four different soil profiles that have different textures, that have different vegetation and different dips and different quantity of organic material and how uh, on top of that you can see the root system that is another language that we are integrating here. And, and the idea is that each of these soils already it's telling you something different, which means that the way that you act or you, you, you work or you deal with these soils, um, it has to be different or has different potential somehow at the end of the day. Okay, I don't know if I'm good on time, but I, we have another, and, and you can go to the web and, and navigate if you want. And then the second language that we are developing is the root system. I'm really obsessed about the root system and basically obsessed about the root system in, in urban conditions. I, I, I don't know how the trees are surviving. Uh, in fact, the trees are not surviving in the urban condition because basically we never draw the root system. And there is literature, there is like in, in uh, Le Col de Montpellier, there is Christophe Renou and Claire Adjé that they are starting uh, doing a lot of research on, on root system of trees and we are also doing that, so translating what is the, uh, the state of the art about the root system of trees. It's quite complex, but we are again simplifying and, 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 and translating that into a logarithm also because uh, the root system um, changes the shape. And so what's interesting about defining this new language is that Finally, we need like a dynamic diagram because um, it's, it's, living, it's living material and it changes over time in the same way that we look different when we are 50 than when we are uh, eight year old uh, root system, it also looks different. So uh, in, this, in this case, you can see a root system overlap with the, with the soil because what's interesting about drawing the tree and Tim for sure, he knows that and he explains that very well, is that where the tree finish, it never finish. When you draw the root system, then you have to draw the soil. And what we are trying to do now is to integrate the soil with the root system. 
again, this is not simulation. This is just a diagram that translates the parameters that we think that are important into, into a drawing. And I don't know if I can show you. Uh, because this is a, a video. I don't know if you're going to see, but this is like um, a tree that it's moving and the root system change because it has two conditions. One, it's an attractor and one, it's a repeller. One, it's an area that it's very uh, compacted, which means that the roots does not grow in that way. And another one, it's an area that, for example, has more fertility of water and then the root system grows in a different way. Of course, when you start designing, or you can even design through that, just designing where the root systems can go. Uh, the root systems could be also part of a project. Uh, I was doing a, several years ago a project in Caracas and all the root systems are very superficial. So why not to think that as a designers we can start highlighting and making uh, this uh, root system visible and part of the project. And then the way that we walk or the way that we pave, the way that we um, communicate with this uh, living life that it's underground us uh, uh, or below ground uh, how, how that can can be translated in, in a different kind of project so I, I really believe that um, landscape architecture has a long way to go now that we are giving the voice to the to the non-living we have to find ways to integrate them in the same way that we integrate a door or a paving or a wall so, and this is the main goal of my research uh, now. And then we have another chapter that it's proposals and what do we do with that? No? So how finally this way of drawing, this way of, of looking for new languages for the living, how, how is this gonna create a new, a new landscape or new way of doing projects? And, and finally, this is the celebration. The celebration is everything that we highlight and you are here because uh, I was really lucky to, to, to be part of this, of this conference. And I don't know if we are on time, but I think that I'm gonna finish here. Uh, just, just sharing that we are starting a project that is called the Garden of the 21st Century that has exactly the same uh, method so we are very strict in saying okay we have sources so what are our sources we translate we translate uh, these sources into drawings and then only then we can start designing and this 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 is like insane it takes a lot because we have this um, tendency to go very fast, to make proposals very fast. When you have been doing projects for 25 years, you always think that you know the answer, but we, we is some, somehow we give always the space to the non-living and, um, and then the answer is something different. And this is what is nice about, about, about the way that uh, we work. I think that I have to finish now, but uh, you're more than welcome to go to the to the web and to see what are our resources and how we are working with, uh, in this case, with horses. Um, so we are doing what we call the garden of the 21st century, that we are recovering the health of the of the soil with horses. That uh, we are partnering with a. a Apodologies of horses, and he has arrived to the same conclusion by looking at the foot of the horses. So uh, uh, it seems that in Spain, the horses are very bad treated. The, the way that um, uh, we are footing, no? making shoes for our horses, it, it's really insane for them. And they, they are discovering that uh, the horses have a better life if they are barefoot, and then there, there is all of these like um, cells that are in the in the food that have repercussions on the on the bones and have the repercussions on the diet and have repercussions on the way that the horse uh, lives. And in this project, what we are doing is that again translating everything, uh, everything that it's living, and and creating like this new uh, landscape uh, that it's merging horses. In, in, in an existing condition uh, 
uh, of a place in, in, in Spain that it's called Senan, that it's a very dry, uh, arid place, and uh, through the horses and all of this abandoned land, we are creating what we call the garden of the 21st century. I, I really welcome you to, to, to look at the, at the webpage and to go through the different uh, 65 entries. And yeah, I'm looking for the conversation. Thank you. Okay.